We're Compound Everything and we talk money, markets, and investing. And today we are talking about Lee Lu and more particularly a lecture he gave the Columbia Business School in 2006. 2006. I believe it was. And before we get going, if you could like and subscribe to this video, that would be really helpful. So, how did we decide to talk about this lecture and Lee Lu in particular? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure how we came about it. We just watch him as an investor and we often will coattail um, famous value investors that we know and kind of appreciate their investment style and he just kind of made it on our radar. For anyone out there who hasn't heard of Lee Lu, who is one of my favorite value investors, here's some information about him. Okay. So he started running his fund in the 90s. 97 is mm -hmm. what he said in the interview. Yeah. yeah. And a life-changing moment for his investing career was when he heard Warren Buffett speak. Yeah, I think four years prior to that at yeah. Columbia. Yeah. yeah, and he mentions that in this lecture, that that was kind of a pivotal moment in, in the way he thought about markets in general. Yeah. So um, seemed to click made sense. Yeah, he runs a fund called the Himalaya Capital Management Fund, mm -hmm. and he is actually pretty good friends with Charlie Munger. Yeah. And I've read that he has compounded since the 90s 30% annually. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. that's a crazy return. Yeah. And I know Charlie Munger had made some money from uh, investment he learned of from Barron's. Mm -hmm. He said he made about $80 million off that investment. Okay. He took that $80 million, he gave it to Lee Lu, and he turned it into four or $500 million. Wow. And Charlie Munger really loves Lee Lu, respects him. Right. And he actually wanted him to come over to Berkshire and eventually, I guess, kind of like be Take over. Take over. But of course, mm -hmm. Lee Lu decided to take a different path, and that path was Himalaya Capital Management, sure. which he's done astounding. Astounding well. Yeah. Anyway, so we took several points home, I think, from the interview with Lee Lu. Lee Lu is a guy who, as you're listening to him speak um, and lecture the students, he's a guy who values, and I think the term is accurate and complete information mm -hmm. is the way I think he phrases mm -hmm. it. And when I hear Lee Lu, that is actually like if someone says Lee Lu, I think complete and accurate information. Yes. So he really broke his investment philosophy down to three parts. Whenever he stumbles across a business, well, firstly, how does he stumble across a business? Well, he says literally he would take the value line papers and go through them business by business by business. And he said he'd be able to look at and quickly analyze a business in about five so minutes. And this is just a screen. It's a superficial screen, kind of top down. And eventually he'd find something. He said eventually after doing that enough times, you develop almost like a, he didn't say this, but I'll say it, a spider sense. You can sniff out value eventually. So once you pass that screen, then he said his investment thesis boils down to three things. Is it cheap? Who's running it? And what did I miss? So in those three things that boils down his entire investing framework. And at that point, he starts running and looks for what he would call accurate and complete information. Now, under the first subheading, you know, is it cheap? That would boil down to, is it a business he can understand? And is it a good business? So from those things, he, he extrapolates and uh, kind of moves forward from there. I think the most interesting thing to me, because, you know, as a value investor, you, that is always your first question. Is it cheap? Right. Right. And as we said before, cheap being in comparison to what the business is actually worth intrinsically. Mm -hmm. But every value investor knows that that is the first hurdle a business has to get through. What really struck me in this particular lecture is how much he focused and zoned in on why. What do you mean by why? Why is it cheap? Oh, what, yes. what am yeah, I yeah. missing? What am I missing? What am I missing? What am I missing? Like no stone unturned because he yeah. said if you have a business and he talked a lot about uh, Timberland, which he made an investment on and made, yeah, a, lot and of, made a lot of money. Of money. And he said like, you know, you could see that it was all these things, it had all these great things going for it, mm. and it just wasn't trading, it was trading way below intrinsic value, mm -hmm. you know? And he was thinking, like, what am I missing? Like, I can't, and he would, essentially, he was second guessing himself, like, I must be missing something, because in order right. for a company of this caliber, of this caliber to trade at such a great price, there's got to be something wrong with it that I'm not seeing. Yeah. That was a that was an interesting little case study he went through the Timberland investment. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact numbers he used, but I think it was trading at somewhere around book value, and I think it was generating returns on equity of something like thirty to fifty percent with like little or no debt. And so, and I think there was a few other things that he had thrown in there as well, just that would give him a margin of safety. And so he looked at it and goes, "Well, what what is going on here?" And then after dissecting it for a little while, he had turned over the fact that there was a whole pile of shareholder lawsuits that were against management. And so I guess the corporate structure was such that, from what I understand, 
um, from his presentation was that the founding family owned uh, a large proportion of the shares, I think something like fifty percent, but also had a hundred percent of the voting. That power. was the issue, and right. that was the that was the issue. But that was what was creating animosity uh, with regards to the management and investors and whatnot. And so a few of these lawsuits sprung up, and so the price dipped. And so at that point, he decided to look into that part of things as much as he could, because he kind of already dissected the business. He even went to the retail stores and saw that people were buying Timberlands and that they couldn't keep them in stock. So from that standpoint, he knew that the, the business model was sound. He knew that they were generating money. And he knew that uh, there was demand for the product. So he had to figure out, so, is the management trustworthy? So he had to figure out, is the management trustworthy? And he went a fair ways on that. And so one of the things he said he did is he looked into every piece of, uh, every court document he could find. Mm -hmm. So he actually went and pulled court documents. Uh, and every word. And read, read all of them. And he told that class, he said, that's what you need to do. Yeah. He said, you need to be willing to read everything everything that you can find yeah. yeah well and he's one of the things that stuck with me he said why should it be easy when you come across this kind of opportunity i caught that too it shouldn't be easy he said, it's not going to be when easy. you make this much money it's not going to be easy right you're gonna to have to put some work yeah. into it and so he went so far as to obtain these court documents and it boiled down to the fact that there was this i think dual class ownership and people just didn't trust the management mm -hmm. i guess at that point and he said well okay i'm gonna go look into that and so he ended up doing some scuttlebutt I guess befriending the management somehow and that was one thing where i kind of like was like eh, because a lot of these guys charlie munger yeah. warren buffett all these guys lee lu they all talk about the management and you need to know the management and like well lee lu befriended them and, and yeah. he said oh i i had a he, i had he said, a friend i had a friend on the board that was on a board with the sun yeah so i got myself so i got on the myself board. and like i pretty much asked can i come on the board like, like you and who, i would who can do that right <laughs> so whenever the management stuff comes up i'm kind of like Having said that though, one of the things he did say is you have to be a lot like an investigative journalist. Yes, he said that many times. Many times. And so you have to be an investigative journalist mm -hmm. in a sense that when you're digging through these stocks, you turn every little every stone. paper trail, or you, every little stone, or you follow every paper trail. Mm -hmm. And at this point, one of the things he said is these people, the management, are often kind of larger than life figures. He did say, he said you don't get to be a CEO by not having a larger than life personality. Yeah, and so that generates a paper trail. Yeah. So follow it. You can Google up. names, you yeah. can look into, you know, their local newspaper, you know, have they made, you know, donations to their, you know, local charities. Even or something like as that. little as writing a shareholder letter. Writing a shareholder letter. A lot of letter. CEOs don't and that and that actually is that says something. The omission of a shareholder letter is telling to what they how much they respect their shareholders for sure yeah do they do they view you as as a equal kind of partner in the business or are you just you know a source of capital for them so in the end he ended up looking into the management and found that they were first class people is what he, he essentially said they were you know absolutely trustworthy and then he said what did he do well he bought a ton of it uh, yeah yeah a lot of it he he put his chips in it yeah. and I think the investment returned something I can't remember what he said five or seven yeah, or tenfold big, or something yeah. like that it was it was a lot yeah. uh, he made a lot of money off of that and interestingly he said that at the time that he purchased it and he was doing all this work and he was putting all this effort into looking into the business mm -hmm. he said even despite all that the stock was still trading around the same level the yeah. entire time and it, I think he defined his time frame as at least a few weeks. Two weeks-ish. Two to three yeah. weeks. I don't know if this one took him two to three weeks. Yeah. Sounds like it might, that one might have taken Maybe a little longer. longer. You know, a lot of this will be maybe two to three weeks of work on a single company. But then the thing he said was with Timberland, it was trading about five times earnings. And uh, so at that point, there was a margin of safety there for him. At least he felt. And he mentioned the margin of safety very often. That yeah. You need that. You need that as a value investor. Mm -hmm. And then he said, look, at five times earnings, let's say it goes up to 15 times earnings, but they're generating, you know, 30% return which equity, they which they were. So their, their earnings continue to go up, but that multiple expands. That's where you make all your money. Right. Is through multiple expansion with growth and earnings. So he essentially was doing what Davis and the Davis dynasty exactly. called the Davis double play. The Davis double play. Yeah. yeah. So you had mentioned that there are three checklist points. That he goes through, yeah. Right. They are, is it cheap? Mm -hmm. Can I trust the management? Mm -hmm. What did I miss? Yeah. And within those checkpoints, he, he actually had another three that he mentioned later. Right. And they were like sub points. Yeah. And these are sub points for the value investor. And they are, you think like a business owner. Yes. You must think like a business owner. Yeah, absolutely. As a That's value crucial. investor. That's crucial. And he said that a few times. Yeah. You have a long time horizon. Right. Businesses take time to play out. And we've yep. seen that over and over again. Yep. 
Jeff Bezos said that um, in their endeavors and what they invest in. Manish Pabrai has said that in his investments. And now Lou, Lee Lu says the second point is yeah. a long time horizon. Well, what is the time horizon? Pardon me? What's a, what's a long time horizon? Well, I would say having read different managers and different investing three to seven years. I was going to say the exact same thing. Yeah. Yep. And then, of course, you've already mentioned this one, a large margin of safety. Yep. And one of the reasons you need that large margin of safety is because what if you miss when you go through the what did i miss mm -hmm. what if you don't catch what you missed right so you need that margin of safety in case there was something that you missed yeah because we're human a lot of the best value investors from what i've seen are people who protect their downside yes it does you no good to you know to go let's say 10 steps forward but 11 steps back mm -hmm. you're, you're nowhere in fact you're further behind and, and warren buffett says that rule number one don't lose money rule number two don't forget rule number one. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so the point being is protect your downside. And so a large margin of safety effectively does that for the value yeah. investor. Yeah. So another thing I noticed in this interview is how much of a voracious learner he is. Oh yeah, for sure. Right. Like, and he said that more than once, you have to be willing to learn, like read everything, psychology, yeah. business, history. math, history. And he yeah. loved, he said history was his favorite. He and he's not the first value investor. We've heard say that that's a common thread, mm -hmm. but he just wants to learn everything because he said everything you learn really helps you in investing. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me a lot of Charlie Munger's mental models, which makes sense because him and Charlie Munger have a friendship yes. and just how hungry he is for information. Yeah. And he just consumes information and that, inf and then he uses all of that, all aspects of life mm -hmm. to help him when he's Develop studying models. businesses mm -hmm. and he just it's really cute. is a seeker of knowledge and a seeker of insight right. and that has helped him bigly mm -hmm. in his investing philosophies and in his investing choices for sure well and then that's why investors will hopefully get better and better over time as mm -hmm. you develop more knowledge and knowledge yeah and he said that as well he said it used to take him a lot longer to mm -hmm. go through the value line yeah. and he said it used to take him longer he said now it takes a couple minutes for him to be like oh yeah that's a value yeah and then he you then know, he'll do his and then he'll do due his, diligence right and then with that he said it's like two weeks yeah. about right of hard work of hard work and that was interesting because he said you'll do you want to do it in a short time yeah you, need, you have to move fast but you have to move fast but you need to do a lot of work in yeah. that short time so yeah. when you find a company a value company that you think is value you, you put all your energy you into know studying you're it. studying eight, eight ten hours yeah, yeah. every day yeah. for two weeks well and even he said you're going to get to the point where you're going to get to like 95 percent of the information mm -hmm. there's probably going to be five percent of the information and i'm kind of paraphrasing a little what he said here reading into it there's gonna be five percent of information you're not going to know about mm -hmm. so but get as close as you can to that right and so that's where that margin of safety protects you yeah is from that five percent you don't know yeah and later on in the lecture someone asked him about mistakes Mm -hmm. And he that said, was interesting. yeah, he said the biggest mistakes he has made are, well, the biggest mistakes he has made are states of omission. Yes. When he knew he it was a value act. and he didn't act, but he said some of the mistakes that he has made were because he didn't do all of, he thought he liked the company yeah. and he said, I really wanted to like the company. Right. So he was willing to kind of ignore some things yeah. and he went in and it didn't turn out well. And he said, and I, I kind of zoned in on this. He said, when that happens, I take my loss. Yeah. And I move, move on. on. Yeah. But he said when he does that, he's also not putting as much money in. But when yes. he, he did say that, yeah. But when he does find a company where he's done all his diligence yeah. and he cannot find anything that he's missed and the management is good at cheap. That's hard. Right. And he kind of took a shot at Wall Street. Yes. Because he said. He talked about 50 basis points, 100 yeah, basis points. Like, and he said, you know, he told the class, I'm glad you guys haven't been um, uh, polluted yet basically in that yeah. you know you allocate you know 50 basis points here 100 basis mm -hmm. points here and it sounds huge but it's only you know 0.5 and 1 percent yeah but that was what, what, I what kind of return are you gonna get off of, yeah. of an investment like that when you're putting 0.5 of your money into it 1 mm -hmm. of your money into it well along that same vein one of the other things he said is and i found this fascinating is that he said the market as such as it is is not designed for the value investor mm -hmm. it's not designed for business owners it is designed for people who want to trade he says it's designed for two types of people, traders yep. and people who run on fear and greed. Right. We start watching numbers go up and down and it, it, it leads to fear and greed. And that's where a lot of the big banks yeah. and stuff make their money. Yeah, sure. exactly. And that's why value investing works. Right. I think that's what he said. 5% of investors are value investors mm -hmm. because it is hard to do yeah. again, simple, but not easy. And the market's not made for value investors. It's right. not made for people with a long time horizon. It's not made for people who are doing a lot of investigative work mm -hmm. and whatnot, but because it's not made for them 
and traders rule the market and traders really do rule the market in the oh, yeah. short term yep value investing works really well right and, and we'll continue to do and so. will continue and he said it's the it's the best way to make money mm. over time yeah because the market is for traders and he even said he said if everyone was a value investor we'd have no stock market right He's right. <laughs> right. You said that. Yeah, it would be it would be completely illiquid. No one yeah. would trade. Yeah, he's like if everyone's a, he's like you could never make money. Right. If everyone was a value investor, he yeah. so he so he said the reason value investing works so well is because the market is actually not made for value yeah. investors. As we were watching, mm -hmm. I noticed like it was a very interactive lecture session. Yep. Right, and he really included the students mm -hmm. in his in his presentation. And at one point he's asking, they all have the handouts that he used. You know where I'm going with this. Yeah, I do. Right? And it, all the information's on there, like how many shares they have out, what it was selling per share, like all the information, the P, the ratios, everything. It almost and sounds like you print off like a value line sheet. I think that's what I thought so too. Like anyway. if you've seen the value line sheet, it has a lot of information on it. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's, and so he asked the class, what's the market? He, I think he was going through Timberland at this time. And, and he's like, so what's the market capitalization of this company? And it was like dead silence. Right. And he's like, okay, what's the market cap? Yes, again. Dad says, he couldn't give it to then him. he takes a shot at the professor. He's like, Bruce, what are you teaching these guys? I thought I caught that. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're not answering and no one's really saying anything. And he's like, you guys should know this. He's like, yeah. and then he takes a shot at them. So then he says, he kind of chastises them. And he says, you guys are the Columbia Business School students. You are the elites mm -hmm. in the investment world right now. Why don't you know this? Right. And then it still is quiet. And then he starts kind of pacing around his desk and he grabs his Coke or Dr. Pepper or whatever, he whatever it was. And starts drinking and puts it down and then picks it up. And you can actually see him getting physically agitated Irritated. that this class could not tell him the market cap. And that was super encouraging to me because I'm like, here is what he said. The yeah. elites, the smartest of the smart at Columbia Business School. And they and they couldn't tell him market cap. No. Well, another point was that it it sounds like, and this goes to his one of his other points, is that they didn't do the homework. Right. He gave them the he information prior and he said like, Essentially, what he, I think he was thinking is, you guys are in this value investing class. I'm telling you, it's going to be hard work, and you're going to make a lot of money if you do the hard work. Mm -hmm. But none of you did the homework. Mm -hmm. So how do you expect to do it? <laughs> so I think that was what really kind of put him off. Right. Well, I think it's something see. as simple as market capitalization. Right. Right. It was an easy question. Very and easy they just question. All, and, you know, and I kind of want to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're intimidated, but they were interactive before that. Yes. They but, kind of clammed up. But yeah, and he was not impressed with no. that. Yeah. yeah. And he, he took a t couple of shots at the industry, like at one point he was talking about investment bankers. Oh yeah. And he said like investment bankers will value a company into infinity. Yeah. And he says, you know it's crap. Right. A little more crass than that. Yeah, yeah. I know it's crap. Right. He knows it's crap. Right. But they do it anyway. But they do it anyway. <laughs> right. right. So yeah. he was essentially saying like, don't get polluted. Yeah. Don't get polluted by Wall Street because Wall Street doesn't, Wall Street, they're not value investors. And yeah. value investing is where the money is in mm -hmm. the long run. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the other things that stuck with me as well through his lecture is he said that you're just going to stumble on things. You got to keep your eyes open and, you know, actively searching, mm -hmm. but opportunities are not going to come to you on the regular, right? So oftentimes, you know, I myself as an investor feel that I got to be doing something. You know, I've got, I've got this money and it's like literally burning a hole in my pocket. I got to be doing something with it. No, and I'm you don't even manage for other people. I don't even manage for other people. Imagine how people who are having to give an assessment monthly of what they're doing feel. Yeah, no, no question. So, you, you know, for, for myself, I feel like I've got to do something. He said, look, these opportunities, while you're going to screen for them, they're not going to come to you regularly. So like, I've never had that happen. Like you'll have batches here and there, but there's going to be opportunities either presented or not presented to you because of you know partly the market cycle so you know in 2021 when the market was you know going kind of nuts yeah. on the high side there probably wasn't much to find mm -hmm. whereas now as things are getting you know beaten up a bit at this point maybe the, the the opportunities are gonna be better so opportunities will present themselves based on you know markets essentially up or down but also as your skill as an investor gets better and better, you're yeah. going to be able to identify those opportunities more readily. And he mentioned that several times. He did mention that several times. And so I think the point is to actively look and again, going back, how do you do that? Well, go through it page by page by page. Just look. One of the things I like to do is go through for Canadians. So there's a website called Cedar. That's S-E-D-A-R.com. Or is it the .ca? It doesn't matter. But I go through the company's listing alphabetically and just go through each one. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of tedious, but it it's can very be, tedious. We've found some good. We've found some companies. decent, decent companies. Yeah. 
right? And to your point, someone asked him, how many positions do you buy a year? Mm -hmm. And he said, I can't answer that. Right. Because there are some I thought years, that was interesting. Yeah, because there's some years I buy none. Right. And then there's some years I buy three. Right. So he said, I've, it's never been consistent. Yeah. But when the opportunity comes, I go balls to the wall. And, yeah, yeah. Literally. And study really hard, yeah. right? Which makes sense because, I mean, at a certain point as a value investor, you don't want your money tied up into garbage. Mm -hmm. You know, that's lost value. Now you've lost capital. So sit on your hands, wait, wait for a good opportunity and then pounce on it when it's good. And I think that's, that's why, where I've had to learn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's why a lot of these guys, Munger, Buffett, Manesh, Lee Lu, all these guys, they all read and yeah. a lot. And I think one of the reasons they read a lot is well, because they like and they want to learn, but it keeps them busy. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Right. It just keeps them out of trouble. One question that was interesting was that somebody said, when do you sell a stock? Yes, that was interesting. And he actually struggled a little bit to, he didn't want to answer right away. And yeah. His answer was, well, I used to sell when it got to a price that I wouldn't buy it at. Right. And I, I kind of chuckled at that because I'm going to be honest, like that is kind of my exit strategy. Right. Right. When I think it's overvalued and I would look at it and be like, yeah, no, that's yeah. I sell it. But he said over the years, he's actually changed his philosophy on yeah. that. And he said now he continues to keep an eye on his company. And if it's still amazing, yeah. it's still profitable, it's still generating returns, it's still got good management. He's like, why would I sell it? Right. Well, and then he talked about the foundations of a good business. When do you sell? He probably into a discussion, which I thought was very valuable on what is a, what is a good business? Yeah. And he said a good business is essentially one that's getting better and better and better all the time, getting kind of more and more and more and more entrenched right. uh, as time went on. And he, this is another one of those times he kind of pimped the class out a little bit. He said, you know, like, give me some companies. And they, eventually, essentially everyone kind of just listed companies that Warren Buffett owned. <laughs> Right. Really? And he even called, he even he's called like, you guys, them out on it. He, he's like, you guys are literally just naming Warren Buffett's portfolio. portfolio. Like, give me one that's not on there. And then yeah. finally, he launched into a little bit uh, onto Microsoft, I think. Yeah. Was one of the ones. Well, actually, used. a good example and is that he used to show what would be a fantastic business was Bloomberg, if it was yes. publicly traded. That's right. And he used it as why it was a really good example. And I won't go into the details, but, he, you know, he was telling us in that lecture yeah. Like these are the things that you, I guess we could go into detail. These are the things that you would look for in a good business. In a good business. Yeah. And you would look for things that like people can't get away from. Yes. Like it is so entrenched. And he talked about switching mode, basically. The, the switching mode, yeah. yeah. And he talked about a time in a business where they're just kind of on the precipice of taking over, of being sticky. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you can watch a business and kind of, and watch them. And so Microsoft was kind of like that, right? There was a time where not everyone had a computer, not everyone. Yeah. Did all that and then all of a sudden you couldn't live without word right you couldn't live without windows yep right and then they just took over and it's like they might not be the best mm -hmm. they might not be better right right and i think he said apple was everyone had a macintosh well i remember well, you and i remember yeah, going to school and we we yeah, all learned on apples yeah. right everyone and then all of a sudden yeah microsoft it was yeah. micro and then it got sticky and he said there was a moment that you could see if you were watching that they were going to take over that people couldn't get away from it even if it wasn't better than apple right you had to use it yeah. well and it's so entrenched in your day-to-day -day life and in your workplace and then you have to go learn a new process mm -hmm. that becomes a very difficult sell to switch even exactly. if it may be better or or whatnot it has to be much much better in order to get you off of that that it's, was it's kind of super interesting when he said people do not want to learn something new it's true so if there is a company that they can use that's good enough yeah they're not going to move over to another company, to another yeah. product, to another service. Yeah. If it's not like 10 X better yeah. because people do not want to relearn. Yeah. So one thing I caught, it was just a simple sentence really fast. He said, when you find those types of companies that are so entrenched in people's life that they're just not going to switch over and it's just the business is getting better and better and better and better. He said, it won't be often that those companies trade for under a 30 PE. Yeah, he did mention that. Right, and he that said, and that's okay. And he right. said, I'm still not going to sell because that company is so good. Yeah. So just something I kind of put in my memory. Yeah. Well, and then going back to the, the, the selling portion of things, one of the things he looks for in a business is a business that he can, with great certainty, predict what it's going to look like in about mm -hmm. 10 to 20 years. Yeah. And he says there's not many of them that that's the case. And especially it's, now. Especially now, I think it's getting harder and harder to do that. Harder. But he said you should be able to predict what that business is going to look like in, we'll call it, at least 10 years. And if he can't, he sells it. Yeah. That so was that was one of the sell criteria. So one was, would I would I buy it at this price? No, sell. And the other one is, can I predict where it's going to be in you know 10 years or so? If he can't, 
sounds like he just makes his money off of it. So if it's a value play, then sells it. So why don't we just summarize his three points and then his three sub points. To summarize, he lose three points for value investors, which he said make up 5% of the invest investors. In the market. In the market. Yep. Is that you need to think like a business owner. Yep. You need to have a long, long time, time horizon time. and you need to have a margin of safety. And then he also had three other points when you find a company, right. which were- Those points are, is it cheap? Who's running it? And what did I miss? Right. Yeah. So I think he ended the lecture. Well, I know he ended the lecture by saying, if you were to follow all those points and you're willing to do your diligence and do really intense homework study. and study and be able to maintain your emotions, he said, if you do that, you will be fabulously rich. That was his conclusion. And that was his conclusion. So I think we'll leave it there too. Yeah. I don't think we can make it any better than yeah. that. So we'll end it there too. Thank you for watching this. If you can like and subscribe and leave comments, that would be great for our video. And we will see you next week.